Welcome to the Living the Dream Podcast with Curveball. If you believe, you can achieve. Welcome to the Living the Dream with Curveball Podcast, a show where I interview guests that teach, motivate, and inspire. Today, I am joined by Peter Young. He is a storyteller, an author, and a former sports broadcaster. We're going to be talking to him today about his story and his work and escaping from a tiny religious cult. So, Peter, thank you so much for joining me today. Curtis, thanks for having me. Why don't you start off by telling everybody a little bit about yourself? Sure. You know, when I when people ask about my background, I kind of give them the Reader's Digest version. So I was born and raised in New Jersey, and I was obsessed with basketball. And I was convinced I was going to be the next Larry Bird. And that didn't happen. So after I played college basketball, I got into coaching, and I was going to be the next John Wooden or Mike Krzyzewski or Phil Jackson. Well, that didn't happen. So then I read a book called What Color Is Your Parachute? It's supposed to help people figure out what you want to do in life. So then I was like, okay, I'm going to be the next Bob Costas. And I got into sports broadcasting. And I had a good run as a sports broadcaster, traveled the world, uh, went to a lot of states, was on ESPN and CBS, et cetera. And, um, but, you know, really my 15 seconds of fame as a broadcaster was a blooper that appeared on Oprah's show. So I was not the next Bob Costas. So now I live out in Montana and I have written two books but I'm not looking to be the next John Grisham or Ernest Hemingway. I'm just trying to be the best Peter Young. Yeah. Well, uh, what, what, what made you get into sports broadcasting and writing? You know, I always loved sports, Curtis, uh, ever since I was a little kid, I played football, basketball, and baseball. And then I played basketball in college. So I always wanted to be around sports. I coached for about two years basketball before I got into broadcasting and I guess I kind of liked being on air. I kind of have that personality. And I love a good story. And really, a good sports broadcaster, that's what they're doing. They're they are telling stories. You know, you watch the game, and the really good ones, telling you the story of the game, the story of that player who just did something really well. So I've always enjoyed that aspect of it. And so then it was kind of a natural progression to go from a sports broadcaster on air, internet, radio, mostly TV, to then writing sports stories. So my first book was about faith and basketball called The Blue Team. The story behind that is that it's um, it's very loosely based on my time playing college basketball, but I wasn't very good, <laughs> and the players in the book are good. But it's the idea that um, the athlete or the basketball player's greatest adversary is not the guy trying to block your shot, the teammate won't pass you the ball or the coach won't play you. It's your own mind. We are our own worst enemy. And when we have something greater than ourselves uh, that we have our identity in, for me, it's a Christian, then, you know, missing the game winning shots, not the end of the world because you don't put your identity in the sport. It's what you do. It's not who you are. Okay. Well, um, you also talked about how you escaped a religious cult. So, Tell us about that experience and how you got in the religious cult in the first place. Yeah, that, that's the big, that's the question, right? The million dollar question. So the short answer is I married into it. So let's go back to the 1996. I was 28 at the time living in Idaho as a sports broadcaster, single. And I kept seeing this girl around town in Pocatello. And she was the blonde girl because she was like six foot one, beautiful blonde hair, couldn't miss her. And uh, I hadn't met her yet. And so then the pastor of our church I was going to started a singles Bible study. And I, you know, I went because I wanted to try and meet a woman and meet my future wife. So she showed up. And I remember walking around the corner that first time we had that Bible study and, and caught her eye. And she looked at me with this welcoming smile like we'd known each other for years. So fell in love right away. The next week she showed up with another guy. They'll do a singles Bible study. So I was like, oh, my gosh stick a knife in my heart and twist it, right? But they didn't act like boyfriend, girlfriend. And um, then a few days later, I was on campus to get an interview with the basketball coach at Idaho State University. Practice was running long. 
So I just wandered around the building, stumbled upon her office, and we talked for a bit. And our first date was we went and lifted weights together. And then I took her to an Italian restaurant and uh, started dating right away. Within 10 days to two weeks, I was 90% sure I wanted to marry her. She was the perfect woman for me, I thought. But she talked about her dad and her uncle Robert all the time. So I thought, well, I've got to meet them because if I'm going to get married to her, they're going to be a big part of my life. So I met her dad around Thanksgiving. He was a little odd, but fine. And a few months later, I met her uncle Robert at uh, her brother's wedding. And he was not her uncle at all. I'm 6'5 with, you know, typical Northern European looks. You know, I used to have blonde hair, now it's gray. My former wife, her name is Paige, you know, blonde hair, blue eyes. My Uncle Robert uh, is this short guy from Syria, olive complexion, bulbous nose, bald on his top, jet black hair, kind of a portly guy. But he was called Uncle Robert uh, because Paige's parents, uh, you know, taught her and her siblings that, you know, it was a sign of respect to call him this. And it just stuck over the years. And so I met him at the wedding. Like, eh, charismatic, odd, but harmless. And I was wrong. Anyway, we got engaged and we got married. First child came uh, 10 months after that. Uh, but slowly but surely over the years, Uncle Robert took on a much larger role in our life. Now, she was he was always the go-to authority for Paige. Paige's parents had met Uncle Robert at a tiny seminary before Paige was even born. So he was always the expert on literally everything. If you had an issue with, like, one of our kids bonked his teeth, you know, we didn't take the dentist's word on what to do. We took Uncle Robert's word. If our one of my dogs was having an issue, oh, what should we do for him to save his life? Ask Uncle Robert. Don't ask the vet, et cetera, et cetera, with everything. And I remember at first I kind of thought he was a nuisance because I love my wife. I thought I was going to be the best husband in the world. She was the best wife. It seems like she was always on the phone talking to him. And uh, her affections were really going towards him. And I didn't really know much of his theology or what he believed in, but I remember shortly after 9-11. Now, I had friends that were in the buildings uh, in the Twin Towers, got out. I had a high school classmate who was widowed during 9-11. And I grew up in a melting pot in New Jersey, so I had friends who were Christian, Catholic, Jewish, black, white, Italian, Greek, Polish, you name it. So we all kind of made fun of each other, and nobody got too uptight about it. You know, we were just kids. But... Shortly after 9-11, we were having a conference. We would have these conferences with Uncle Robert, and he's the cult leader. And I didn't know it at the time. I wouldn't have called him a cult leader. He was just odd. And he was telling me how 80,000 people died on 9-11, and President Truman was a Jew, and Roosevelt was a Jew. And I remember being stunned. Like, there was a really dark, sinister tone to it. He was virulently anti-Semitic. And I, I kept asking questions, like, well, what do you mean? Like, what? this doesn't make sense. And you know, I was supposed to ask questions of cult leaders. And again, at that time, I still didn't see him as a cult leader. It was only a few years into our marriage. But Paige, my wife, believed everything he said. Her parents believed everything he said. So he just didn't go away. He was always there, little by little by little, as I, year after year, went along to get along with my wife. I slowly kind of got sucked in. Now, this is a key thing for your audience to know, is that my story could happen to anybody. Cult leaders don't start spouting off lies and nonsense to you. Nobody would believe them. They will say things that might be quite literally true uh, and factual and could provide you with good, solid information. And then that over time, they twist it and pervert it to years down the road. You know, you're on the cult. You have no idea. I always say, you never know you are in a cult. You only know you were in one. So, for instance, to give it an analogy, let's say you miss hit a golf ball by like a quarter inch. Well, you miss hit a golf ball by that little bit, 200 yards down the fairway, the ball is going to be way off to the left or way off to the right, nowhere near the pit. Well, Uncle Robert would tee up the correct golf ball, so to speak, as this analogy unfolds, is he would read the Bible to us, but then he would put his little perverse, unique twist on every single verse so that 5, 10, 20 years down the road, we were way away from the real gospel, from what the Bible is trying to tell us. So... We would have these conferences, and then I would learn more and more about his theology, crazily anti-Semitic. Um, he never had a full-time job, so he would go to casinos and gamble all the time. And he called casinos the true churches in America, literally. <laughs> I remember thinking, really? Like, I go to a casino, and if you want to gamble, that's fine, but I don't see people worshiping the Lord at casinos. I see him worshiping money. And he also called casinos his office. Because he felt like anybody could go to a casino, regardless of your bank account, your status, your success, age, gender, whatever, and be blessed by the Lord. Okay, 
But the Bible also talks a lot about hard work uh, and not just trying to go to a casino because everybody walks in the casino. It's thinks it's going to be their night. And so he never had a job. Uh, we would see him a couple of times a year at these conferences where he would just talk for hours and hours. He lived in Southern California. We lived in Idaho and Montana. And so in addition to the anti-Semitism, uh, you know, every war, recession, depression was some kind of Jewish conspiracy. Um, he also really started to take over the affections of my wife. I had lost my wedding band a few years into our marriage. Couldn't find it. Finally bought a new one. Years later, I found the original wedding band. And this is like 10 years into our marriage. So the bloom was off the rose. I could clearly tell that she really adored and, and respected Uncle Robert more, she, more than she did me. And I was so excited I found the original wedding band. And she was you know, happy for me. But just so happened that around that time, Uncle Robert had called her and said that he lost his wedding band. So she asked me, she said, you can't wear two of them. Let's send one, the other one to Uncle Robert. And I was like, I found it unseemly. I didn't want to do this. But I went along to get along with my wife. A few years later, we had five kids at the time. And Uncle Robert had two sons. They were adults now, married, and they had daughters, but no sons. They had adopted a son, but they had daughters, no sons, no biological sons, so no biological heir. Well, Paige wanted to be a surrogate and have a male heir, a son, so that Uncle Robert's plush, precious bloodline could continue. Because after all, he's the smartest man on the earth, or so she thought, and her parents. And I was adamantly against this. I couldn't believe, I mean, the thought of my wife having Uncle Robert's grandson inside of her made me physically ill. And uh, she was very upset. You know, she wanted to offer this to Uncle Robert and, and I was against it. And then she disclosed to me that she'd taken a vow before the Lord that she would not have another child with me because we had talked about having another child until she could offer this to Uncle Robert and his son. And Uncle Robert finally did say, you know, hey, listen, you know, you should not have taken a vow to the Lord against your husband. That was wrong. So in the end, she listened to Uncle Robert, not me. We never had another son and she never was a surrogate. Nothing even came of it. And then Uncle Robert became our marriage counselor. Paige wanted us to have a marriage counselor. I didn't think we needed one. She wanted him to be our marriage counselor. And it was, again, I went along to get along. I didn't want anything to do with him being in our marriage. I resented the role that he played in her life where a lot of really important intimate details would get shared with me second. He heard them first. And I was pretty sure every single marriage counselor on the face of the earth would tell us that the number one thing you two need to do to save your marriage is to get Uncle Robert out of the marriage. Of course, we weren't going to hear that. So slowly but surely, I was like the frog in the you know, pot of boiling water, the proverbial frog in hot water. And, uh, you know, years of skepticism slowly gave way to, you know, I love my wife. I adored her. This guy can't be that dumb. He can't be that bad. Maybe I'm missing something. So one of these conferences, we would have these a couple times a year in northern Idaho at Paige's parents' house. And he would talk on and on and on and on. And really weird stuff, too. For instance, I'll give you an example. During the 2016 election between Trump and Clinton, um, he described... Hillary Clinton, as um, used the metaphor of the female hyena. So in Africa, you've got the female hyenas, and uh, the female is often the leader of the pack. And after she has given birth, uh, she'll have this fleshy appendage that hangs down from her groin that looks like a penis. And so Uncle Robert said, "Well, that, that's that's right there. That's Hillary Clinton. You know, and she was going to be the proverbial, you know, badass female hyena." strutting around the world and, and other world leaders will figuratively lick her groin. And it's disgusting, this kind of stuff. And, and I had four kids at the time under the age of 10 that were at these conferences that would hear this. But whatever was inappropriate for you, Curtis, or me, or anybody else was always okay because it was Uncle Robert. He knew better. He was brilliant. So we, uh, one of these conferences, he asked all of us to show up and give our testimony in the Lord, what the Lord has done for you, how you became a Christian. And I knew that Paige and Uncle Robert and her parents all doubted me. So I tailored my testimony just to satisfy them. It didn't work. So after you know, 17, 18 years of marriage, I finally caved and said, oh, I must not be a Christian and allowed Uncle Robert to quote unquote save me, which I did not need. It was not necessary. And then Paige didn't believe me. Uncle Robert didn't believe me. So we tried it again the year later and then again. So then Paige finally left me almost 20 years into our marriage considered me, you know, a fraud because I had lied. I'd never been a Christian, which is just not true. And um, 
you know, I was would have been fully brainwashed for about two, two and a half years. And so, you know, through my faith, family, and friends, after she left, I finally got out of it, saw the light. My eyes and ears were open. And I saw how wicked it was. And it, there was a tremendous amount of emotional, spiritual, and mental abuse. That I, I'm just going to hit some of the highlights. But there, there was, Curtis, if you were to look up online, you know, the indicators of a, sorry, go ahead, Curtis. I was going to tell you something else, but go ahead. No, I was just going to ask, and I think you were about to talk about it. What are the signs of a religious cult so other people might know and not get trapped into one? Sure. So, you know, if you were to look online and just you know type it in, Google, um, we checked all the boxes. And Uncle Robert, as a leader, checked all the boxes. So they all look a little different, cults do. And some people don't like the word cult. Uh, you could call it undo mind control. Because cults really start in the mind. And we didn't, you know, shave our heads. There was no sex going on. There was no violence. We drank the Kool-Aid. You know, we didn't live in a commune. Uh, but they all have at least a leader, right? That's the number one sign. And he's usually usually a man, charismatic, um, very narcissistic, has a grandiose sense of self. You know, Uncle Robert would always go to D.C. and supposedly talk with congressmen. And they knew him on a first-name basis. And then he makes all the rules, but none of them apply to him. And then he will often act as a gatekeeper to God. And this could be Buddhism or, or being a, a Muslim or a Christian. And so he would act as a gatekeeper. Cults also operate on secrecy and paranoia. So one of the biggest indicators, or let's say warning signs, Curtis, like if you have a friend or relative or coworker, is that uh, they also withdraw from all of their long-term re relationships or their friends and relatives. Because again, the cult leader you know, probably that person knows, you know, that what he's doing is immoral, but he needs to be protected. So then he will tell all the followers, well, you know, your friends or your relatives won't understand. They don't get it. You and I, were special. And so we're in constant danger. So then you circle the wagons and you have all the secrecy and paranoia. So nobody on the outside really knows what's going on inside the cult. And that's how cult leaders maintain the control. So people that you know, they kind of, you know, just kind of suddenly withdraw from all their normal relationships. And um, the paranoia that everybody else is different, they don't get us, and they are the danger. My old friends and my old and my relatives are the danger. Only the cult leader understands me and has kind of the, the word of truth cornered. So what do you mean by the phrase when you say you don't know you are in a cult, you only know that you were in one? Good question. So to me, again, sometimes people get a little uptight about the word cult. So let's call it undo mind control. I think they're the same thing. And it really starts in the mind. And so when you are in the cult, you, you just don't know it. Like nobody voluntarily joins a cult. They think they're joining something else. In my situation, I never joined anything. I got married. I married into it. And I slowly but surely got sucked into it. But once you realize you are in a cult, well, then the mind control has dissipated and it's starting to go away. So then you're not in the cult. You'll never know it when you're in it. Only when you get out of it and that the mind control no longer is strong and powerful to where you can think for yourself, then you'll see, yeah, I was in a cult. Again, the moment you realize, oh, I'm in a cult, you're really out of it mentally, if that makes sense. Because cult leaders will make you doubt every single thought and action and word that you say and think, because you have to start thinking the way they want you to. So you constantly doubt yourself. So you'll never be able to come to the conclusion to be able to think independently and say, oh, this sounds like a cult. Boy, am I in a cult? It's only till you have friends and family help rescue you. Then you can be mentally well enough to say, that was, that was a cult. Thank God I'm out. So tell the listeners about your books. Tell us what we can expect when we read them and where we can get them from. So both of my books are available on Amazon. So the first one is The Blue Team, and that's the story about faith and basketball. Um, and again, it's very loosely based on my time uh, playing basketball at George Washington University in D.C. Um, but the book, you know, the team makes a nice run in March Madness. It's it's really thrilling. And and I, I spent a lot of time clapping at the end of the bench during my career. We were very good. 
But uh, really, it's the story within the story that I'm most proud about, uh, where it really tells. And it's a great book for high school and college kids or any kind of athlete. Because, again, the athlete that's always focused on, like, you know, the pitcher wants to strike him out or the guy wants to tackle him in football or wants to block a shot in basketball. Our own mind is the greatest adversary. And when we can conquer our own mind, our own fears, our own doubts, right, that's when we become a great athlete. And that's applicable to all walks of life as well, to the baker, the banker, and the butcher, right? Our own mind is what holds us back. And I believe as a Christian, that's where the key lies when you have your identity in something greater than yourself. Then you can relax and play the game and have fun. And then my memoir that just came out in March of 2023 is called Stop the Tall Man, Save the Tiger. And that details what I just talked about, about the little uh, religious cult that I was in. And um, it talks about how, you know, all these stories of what went on and eventually Paige, you know, my wife did leave me. You know, we, I thought we had the greatest marriage ever for the first few years of our life. But then, you know, 20 years later, she called me a, a devil, a sorcerer, a sperm donor, a bloodline, a liar, a bully, belligerent, coward, all kinds of names. There was an incredible amount of hatred, poison, and judgment and condemnation that went from Uncle Robert right into Paige, and then eventually went into our five children. And so, thankfully, I was rescued, and so were my youngest three children from that little mini cult. It's a story that's very hard to put down. I mean, once you get into it, it's it's pretty amazing. My lawyer said, you know, Peter, maybe you should fictionalize it and start, turn it into a novel. And I said, no one would believe it. So that's why I made it into a memoir. So I got a couple of more sp sports questions for you. You, you. you have a phrase that you say sports is the perfect metaphor for life. So tell the listeners what you mean by that. Sure. You know, I, I encourage all my kids to play sports because there's so much that you can learn through sports. You can learn respect for you know, the authority, how to be a good teammate, how to set goals, how to work hard, uh, et, et cetera, et cetera. I love using sports as a as a metaphor for life in terms of let's say even like politics and economics, right? Like, you know, certain economic principles would be like tying LeBron James's hand, you know, one hand behind the back. And, you know, he has to, you know, play the game with, with one hand. Uh, to me, you could use sports to uh, explain all kinds of, of things in life. Um, and that's really why I enjoy talking about sports and enjoy being a sports broadcaster and, and writing about it because the lessons that you learn, the moments on the court or in the field where you have to overcome adversity, where you have to make a tough choice, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, those are applicable to all areas of life. Again, like in our society now, we've got so much where people want to make decisions, whether it's in politics or education or, law or whatever it is, or economics that are based on, you know, how you look, your your gender, uh, your race, age, et cetera, et cetera. But we all love sports and we all love watching sports. And sports is like the, the perfect example of it doesn't matter what you look like or what your background is. You have to perform. If you don't run fast, you will come second in the race. If you cannot tackle, your football team will lose. It doesn't matter about all this other stuff that goes on in our society. And um, I, I think, you know, People that cover economics and education and politics, people that write about it and people that are involved in it would do themselves a favor and all of us a favor if they watched more sports and saw how, you know, competition is what elevates all of us. And sports is, the, is probably the one part of our society left that really demonstrates that. Well, tell the listeners about some of your most memorable moments in, in your career as a sports broadcaster. You know, one of the funnier stories, well, I got two funny stories. First one, when I was younger, when I was in Idaho, in Pocatello, where I met Paige, my future wife. I was doing the six and 10 o'clock sports, you know, small market TV. Um, and we were an ABC affiliate at the time. And back in the 90s, Oprah, you know, was like the biggest show on TV, the Oprah Winfrey show. And maybe some of your young listeners don't remember her, but I mean, that was a huge hit. Number one across the board. And it was on ABC. So the producers for her show sent out a memo to all the ABC affiliates around the country and said, we're doing a show on laughter and send in your bloopers if there's somebody laughing. Well, sure enough, you know, I'm like 27 year old, you know, pretty, pretty green in the, in the sports broadcasting industry. And one night, you know, it's around Christmas time or New Year's Eve. It's late. It's cold. It's dark outside. And I'm on live TV and the camera's on me. And I, for some reason, just got the giggles and could not stop laughing. And I'm just 
practically crying laughing. And that made Oprah. That was my 15 seconds of fame. My blooper laughing made Oprah. And then the other funny story was um, I got to call the uh, and cover the uh, U.S. Winter Olympic trials. So the Olympics, right, Curtis, like the greatest athletes in the world are going to go compete against all the great athletes around the world. And I got to cover the Olympic trials for curling, which is not in the most athletic sport for sure. But still, these guys are going to the Olympics. And so when the team finally won and they were going to be the American uh, representative to the Olympics, uh, the skip or the captain, you know, the leader of the team, was giving you know the, his press conference in an interview. So I'm interviewing the guy with my mic, you know, and, and there he is. He's going to the Olympics, and he's got a cigarette in one hand, he's got a Budweiser in the other. <laughs> and I thought this doesn't look like a world class athlete. But that was a funny moment. Do you have any current or upcoming projects that you're working on that people need to know about? Yes. So um, I am working on the sequel to the Blue Team. So in the blue team, you know, the main character is Thomas Connor, and so he's an athlete. In the uh, in the sequel, which is going to be about seven or eight years later, he's now going to be a coach, and he was a Division One college basketball coach. And so eventually, it'll be a trilogy. I'll have a third book. So hopefully, in twenty twenty four, I will be able to publish the sequel to the Blue Team. Don't have a title yet, but that one will be coming out hopefully next year. Well, the watch here contact information now, any websites or anything like that so people can keep up with everything that you're up to. Yes. So I have um, my website is author Peter Young, um, dot com, And then um, my YouTube channel is, uh, let me, I'm going to pull it up here real quick. My YouTube channel is uh, at uh, author Peter Young. Yeah. Author Peter Young. So that's my YouTube channel. And then my, again, my website is authorpeteryoung.com. Uh, and then I do have a Facebook page, and that is also uh, author Peter Young. So they're all pretty much the same. All right. Well, close us out with some final thoughts. Maybe if there was something I forgot to touch on that you would like to talk about or any final thoughts you have for the listeners. You know, uh, just to say thank you for having me on the show, Curtis. You can find, again, both of my books on Amazon. Uh, I would love the support and and really uh, Stop the Tall Man, Save the Tiger, to me is an important book because hopefully my story, what I went through, can serve as a cautionary tale, kind of a wake-up call for others that might know loved ones in their lives that might be in danger of getting sucked into a cult. All right, ladies and gentlemen, authorpeteryoung.com. Be sure to check out Peter's books and pick up uh, his upcoming book. Keep up with everything that he's up to. If you know somebody or you yourself are in a religious cult, definitely make sure you pick up the book. Please be sure to follow, rate, review, share this episode to as many people as possible. If you have any guests or suggestion topics, please send them to cjackson102 at cox.net. Thank you for listening. And Peter, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, Curtis. Appreciate it. For more information on the Living the Dream podcast, visit www.djcurveball.com. Until next time, stay focused on living the dream.